Hello and welcome to Politics Today. In this programme today, we'll be discussing the EU referendum, uh, which is the biggest vote uh, for a generation, as we, the British public, will decide whether we remain in the European Union or whether we go it alone. So in this programme, to discuss all the issues involved with the EU referendum, I'm joined by Mark Sutherland, who's a filmmaker awesome. and uh, very passionate about the issue of Europe. So, Mark, uh, welcome to Politics Today. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely to be here. Pleasure. Uh, uh, Mark, can you share something about uh, your background? Because you, you're involved in the creative arts, mainly in filmmaking, and uh, you've made um, a movie called Flexit the Movie, all about our, our relationship with Europe and the European Union. I've, I've just had the privilege to make a uh, film a presentation, as I said, called Flex in the Movie, um, by two very important people, um, Richard North and Christopher Booker. They wrote a book in 2003. It was published called The History of Europe and the Great Deception. And the clue is in the title, The Great Deception. They'd met in 1992. Christopher Booker writes uh, a regular column in the Daily Telegraph. And Richard North is, I think, one of the most premier political uh, researchers that the, w that the world has. So they then got together from 92. They've written about, I think, uh, four books, plus um, things like Castle of Lies, other investigation into the BSE, around the whole European question. And so the great deception came about because of uh, papers have been released you know, the 30-year lock has come off. We now have the internet. So it enabled them to do loads of research and come to a conclusion that we have been deceived. Hence why deception is on the front of that book. That we, that when Ted Heath took us in to Europe in 1973, and we could go through a little bit of history, things were not properly explained. That actually in 1973, we lost our sovereignty. So, in 1970, I think, Heath had won that election. There was a in very small writing in their manifesto was, I will take you into the European Union. In 1961, I think, they first applied to join the uh, European Union, and, or the EEC, so it's an economic um, union at that time. So, Hugh Gateskill made a famous speech in 61, where he said, if we join, it ends a thousand years of history and all the rest. And just for the record, it's something that Tony Benn had fought all his life about joining the uh, European Union and actually saying, how do I get rid of you? They are unelectable. So there's a number of bureaucrats who then tell us what to do. So if we go back to the history, so what Christopher and what Richard had then uh, found out, and I was drawn to this, and I'll tell you the story of why I then made it, is because I read the book, The History of Europe and the Great Deception, and um, a steam came out of my ears after a, after a few chapters because I just thought that history, that, that information is not out there in the mainstream at all. And we are in a propaganda war. Whatever people think, we are in a propaganda war. So let's put it in context. So in 1975, when the last time we had the chance to vote to come out, we had about three television channels. You know, BBC One, ITV, maybe BBC Two. We had far more of a restrictive to information that, than we had now. And I think there was more of a sort of a, a doffing of a, one's cap and actually believing what the BBC said and other mainstream uh, television stations or news channels actually said. So we're going to put that in context. If you say, like in America, you have 1,583 outlets that are now owned by uh, media outlets that are now owned by seven companies. We have that same kind of thing that's going over here in regard to how it's controlled regionally and then becoming London-based. And you may say, well, why are you saying that? So when you're in a position when we're about to make the most important decision in my lifetime that affects me, affects my children, etc., and everyone else, we have to make sure that the information is out there. So I read this book. Fortunately, a friend of mine uh, knows uh, Richard North, and I phoned him up. I said, we need to interview you. We need to get you on what you have to say out there. So he very kindly then asked me to film the presentation, which is Flexit, at the Royal Overseas Club in Green Park. So we did that. And um, we have loaded up eight, eight films. And excuse the plug, but let's just say this. 
So you have the full movie at 82 minutes. You then have four parts at 20 minutes. You then have another interview with them, some public reactions and a QA. and I have, I, have, I have to ask you, Mark, um, in, in terms of this issue, uh, and it's clearly dominating our news mm. headlines, has done for weeks, and, and the closer as we get to the referendum date on the uh, Thursday, the 23rd of June, mm. um, the bigger this is going to become. Now, why is this whole issue so important uh, for Christians and to, for Christians to understand what's at stake uh, at this referendum? For me personally, from a, uh, as a Christian, from a Christian point of view, this is about sovereignty. This is about the fact that we, I believe, we have been deceived and we have handed over the sovereignty and how to run our nation to a supranational government that was planned from 1924 by a man called Jean Monnet and another guy called John Salter. That is why. It's also the fact that as nations under God, we all have roles to play. And in the past, we have had an incredible role to play with faults where we've taken the gospel around the world. And also the fact that, you know, in the past, we've been the center of industrialization and all the rest and how that money was created and what we did with it. That is important. And it isn't just all about economy. It's about the fact that are we going to trust God in the future? Are we actually going to read our Bible and go, this is what scripture says. We bring this to God instead of going, it's all about economics, mammon, all the time. There are other bigger issues than, than this. In the fact that we are now reaching a point where there are things that we cannot say, there are things that we can't do. We have a supranational government that we haven't actually voted for that will make decisions involving many, many no a number of countries. And um, I do not think that that is the line that we should go down. And if we say biblically then, if we take the book of Daniel, and now we're moving into territory of prophecy, you know, la-la land to some. Is this, is the, I think, you know, even G Jesus said in Matthew 24, he spoke, of, he spoke of Daniel. So we read those first six books and then we read the rest. We then need to bear in mind about going into Egypt and went into Egypt because that's where the corn is, captivity and all those kind of things. And people say, well, what relevance is that? Well, we either believe the book or we don't. I do. Yes, biblical prophecy, I'm not a prophet, is an area where so many people have been criticized and all, and all the rest for. But if Jesus is referring to those prophecies then we need, I believe, we need to look at that. And it's about, are we captives? Do we want to be slaves? Or do we want to be free? And as uh, Christopher Booker said brilliantly, you know, there's some fantastic people in this country. Problem is, they're not actually running the country. So That's a good point. So let's, uh, let's have a look at this uh, presentation. Uh, it's entitled, um, uh, Think Before You Vote. Uh, in terms of the EU referendum that looks at uh, British history and how British history is very different from that of French and European history. Four centuries ago, brother for brother in the English Civil War, we have engaged in this kingdom and ventured our lives. And it was all for this, to recover our birthrights and privileges as Englishmen. I tell you this, I am resolved to give my birthright to no one. Whatever may come in the way, and whatever be thought, I will give it to none. Poor soldiers like us fought for the preservation of this kingdom. And now we demand the birthright for which we fought, with the law of God and the law of our conscience with us. The Great Charter, looked to by generations of Englishmen as the bedrock of their constitution and an assurance of traditional liberties. Why did Magna Carta prove to be more than just words on a page? Why did revolution in England First the Civil War and Commonwealth, then the Glorious Revolution, not collapse into bloodshed and dictatorship like the French Revolution. 
Why did churches champion the individual against an overmighty state instead of serving as agents of repression? Slavery is so odious that nothing could be suffered to support it but positive law. Every man who comes to England is entitled to the protection of English law, whatever oppression he may hitherto have suffered, and whatever be the color of his skin, whether it is black or whether it is white. English law does not recognize the institution of slavery. This man shall go free. Across the channel, a very different set of ideas was beginning to take root, which would lead in a very different direction. One of the prime movers in the new thinking was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Building on the concept of man as a noble savage, reluctant to submit to authority, Rousseau cast around for a legitimate authority to which those who had been newly liberated could submit. He concluded that there was only one, the people, and what he termed the general will. But if law is the expression of the general will, it follows that its moral content is irrelevant. This viewpoint is alien to the traditional common law of England. It runs completely counter to the ethos of Magna Carta. The business of this court is to see justice done. For really, I think the poorest he that is in England has a life to live as the greatest he. And therefore, truly, sir, I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first, by his own consent, to put himself under that government. Magna Carta and the things which grew from it are a pearl of great price. In a very real sense, they're England's gift to the world. What will we do with this gift? That's up to us. And to make the case uh, for Europe, we're now joined by uh, the very uh, reverend uh, Michael Sagro for Christians for Europe. Uh, Michael, welcome to Politics Today. Thank you very much, Simon. That's a pleasure. And uh, Michael, can you share something um, uh, uh, about your background and uh, the work that you've been involved in? Well, my personal background is that um, I've been a priest in the Church of England for over 40 years. But uh, in connection with Europe, I suppose my thinking is very much colored by my origins, which are that my mother was a German-Jewish war refugee who got out of Nazi Germany in 1938. So I have strong roots in continental Europe and strong reasons for believing that our place as the United Kingdom belongs there. Excellent. Uh, um, was that on the uh, Kinder Transport? Not on the Kinder Transport. It was privately arranged, but it happened at about the same time. No, incredible. Uh, absolutely remarkable period of uh, history. Uh, Michael, can you share with us uh, today why you're so passionate um, as a Christian that we should actually remain in the European Union and the reasons why? Yes. Well, I think it is about much more than simply what's best for Britain. Now, that was the mantra that we heard a lot about at the time David Cameron went to the summit in Brussels. Obviously, what's best for Britain matters to me and should matter to all of us who are citizens of this country. But Christianity says to us that we need to love our neighbor as ourselves. And to me, organizations like the EU, and not only the EU, are all about how we can work together as nations for the common good of humanity, how we can especially care for those who are in more need than we are, how we can together protect the environment. Now, the EU, as everybody says, is by no means a perfect organization, but it does bring peoples and nations together, and together we can achieve things that we can't achieve on our own. So for me as a Christian, it's all about the second of the two great commandments, that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And the whole instinct, it seems to me, of the Christian gospel is towards integration, towards bringing people together, towards relationships, towards community, not 
isolation, which is what I believe Brexit would lead to. Um, but when we look at uh, the European Union, uh, it, it's been a very much a, a process uh, and a process of building certain blocks. And when we, when we look at the kind of original vision of the Treaty of Rome and where Europe is leading to, it, it's essentially leading to a European superstate, isn't it? And what we're seeing is that uh, the, national, the, the nation states of Europe are having less control, less sovereignty, less power uh, over our own destiny, and it's being controlled by uh, unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats uh, working for the European Commission. Well, there are several things there that I'd want to comment on. The first is that in no way is the European Union a super state, and it's not likely to become one. I think the EU is a, um, a coalition of states bound together by treaty who have one another's concerns at heart. And it's quite clear that political union isn't going to happen between the 28 member states, even if it were wished for. I think as far as the transparency and democratic credentials of the EU are concerned, well, the heads of state are all directly elected who form the council. The European Parliament is directly elected, our MEPs. The commissioners are appointed by elected people. And I think it is a fantasy to say that the EU is not a democratic body. I agree it could be more transparent and more accountable in its processes. But here we are in this country with an unelected head of state and an unelected second chamber. I hardly think we can throw stones when it comes to democracy. And I have to, I have to ask you, Michael, what was your impression of the campaign so far? Is some of the major issues um, being... Um, take, deflected from mainly this mainly personality battle that we're seeing between uh, David Cameron and uh, also Boris Johnson. It's depressing, isn't it, that politics seems to come down so much to personalities and the relationships between them. The campaign at the moment seems to me to be uh, very self-centred. It's all about what's best for us, what's best for me as the voter. And as I said before, that matters, but it's by no means all that matters. So I think we need to turn the campaign outwards and ask ourselves what's best for the peoples of Europe, what's best for the human race, what's best for the planet. And I really wish that we could emphasize those things, because that is part of the founding vision of the European Union, which was to seek the common good, to develop solidarity with working people and with the poor and underprivileged, and to empower nation states to realize their potential. I think that the campaign is probably going in the direction of remain. That's to say, I think the arguments are on the whole being won by the remain camp, but that's not the same thing at all as saying that that translates into votes. I think it's too close to call. And those of us on the Remain side need to work very, very hard in the next four weeks to make sure that the voice of Remain is heard and that common sense prevails over madness. So, uh, Michael, I just want to thank you so much uh, for giving up your time to speak to us today on the importance of the uh, voting to Remain in the European Union. You're very welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. And uh, Mark, I have, I have to ask you, really, that hasn't much of this campaign so much been focused on personalities, particularly between David Cameron and Boris Johnson, all the arguments that we're hearing in um, any kind of news reports or economic base, they're all about uh, the price of holidays will go up if we vote to leave, uh, our mortgages will go up, um, the four horses of the apocalypse will come <laughs> against Britain if we leave as well. So you know, how much is this fear and how much is this reality? Or the you know the Thames will turn uh, will turn red if we leave the EU. Um, I'm extremely disappointed by the fact that this seems a bunch of puerile fight in the playground at Eton. You know that is what's going on, and and people are not getting people are not getting the the uh, the facts. So e you could even say that by putting 350 million pound on the side of the bus, that certain things just do do not add up at all. So I deliberately come back to it, Simon, the reason why Flexit, that presentation by Richard North, is so, is so important is because there is a definitive plan, and that is of exit. Leaving Europe is a process, and there is a process to do it. 
It's actually leaving Europe governance. It's not leaving Europe, right? That's the two things. Some people say, oh, we well, want to leave. It must mean you hate Europe. Not at all. It's leaving Europe governance. And other European nations, believe it or not, would want to do exactly the same. We've just seen protests, well, on some TV channels, in Paris, in Madrid, in Greece, about and about all those issues, about austerity, et cetera, et cetera. So coming back to Flexit, Richard North, 40-odd years has gone on about this. There's been 400 contributions to this. This has been well and truly thought out. The sad thing is, is that people, well, 70,000 people have downloaded the Flexit plan from the EU referendum.com website that he set up. And I'm going to quickly come to that, of why that he set that up. So in 2004, he established the EU referendum website. Coming up to the election in 2005, where all the mainstream parties, Labour, Tory, Liberal, promised, they promised a referendum on that issue. By 2007, we still hadn't had it, Michael Howard stood down, Cameron came in as leader of the Tories and said, I will a cast iron guarantee that we will have a referendum on this. Lisbon arrives... The, the French and the Dutch say, no, we don't want this Lib Lisbon, which is actually a constitution, a European constitution. Because two countries reject it, they then do a very sleight of hand. We now call it a treaty that goes on. So it adds to this whole thing of deception. So you and I have not been asked about that. We certainly weren't asked in 73 about, well, we were very young, but at that time, so, or may important. not have been born, exactly. but sovereignty wasn't yep. discussed. So then Gordon Brown, he's taken the, uh, he uh, has become uh, leader of the Labour Party. And in 2009, he signed it. He signed the treaty. There'd been no discussion. And Cameron turned around and goes, well, you know, there's not a lot we can do about that now. Yeah. Mark, we're, we're down to the last uh, three minutes. What do you mm. think's at stake uh, in this election? Because this is probably the biggest vote uh, for a generation. Uh, and even Nigel Farage has described it as the biggest vote in our lifetime. Absolutely. I think what is at stake fundamentally is us being able to trade with the rest of the world, to make decisions as a country, but more importantly, to get to the top table, like everyone else is entitled to do. Everyone's entitled to be at the top table. By being in the EU, we are not at the top table. One person goes in representing the 23-odd different countries, right? That's what it's about. It's about being at the top table, making decisions for us as a nation. Now, before someone else turns around and says, yes, but it's like putting Britain first and all the rest, not a bad idea, but it's also looking at our neighbours and going, right, what's the best thing for them? What can we do as well? How can we help them? But we make those decisions better by being out. And the key thing is, and someone's going to go, you know, fishing industry. So in 1973, when Heath came in, the classics, we actually sacrificed our fishing industry to get in. And the classic comment of Heath going, you know, how many people are involved in the fishing industry? Someone says to him, 22,000. Well, that's an insignificant number, or words to that effect. We, as the people, should be able to, if we vote for people, to say, right, you're going to put our interests first. What's very interesting, when we have a situation when you've got, Kat, you know, uh, Osborne and uh, Ed Balls and Vince Cable all on the same platform saying the same thing, you wonder if we're a one-party system. Uh, Mark, I just want to thank you so much uh, for joining me on, on, on politics today. And this is clearly something that uh, you're very passionate about. And uh, it's something that we all should be passionate about, our, our relationship with Europe. Because come Thursday, the 23rd of June, this is our opportunity to vote and decide the destiny of Britain. Will Britain remain uh, part of the European Union? Or will Britain decide to leave the European Union and go in a completely uncharted territory, meaning that we gain sovereignty and control of our own borders and our own government. So lots of issues are at stake. And I think as Christians, it's important that we pray uh, and really seek God's heart on this issue because so many issues are at stake, um, particularly for Britain and that of Europe. And uh, sadly, uh, when we look at what's happening in Europe with the 
disintegration of borders, the problems with um, the migration cr crisis, the Euro crisis. There are major problems. So we need to pray and have discernment before we actually vote come, uh, come polling day on Thursday, the 23rd of June. So thank you for watching today's Politics Today.